Hello again. In Liverpool on May the 10th, 1915, angry crowds attacked shops belonging to people with German names. Some of the owners of these shops had been living in Britain for 50 years and had sons serving in the British Army, but it made no difference to the furious mobs. Houses were looted and what could not be carried away was thrown into the street and set on fire. Similar scenes took place across the country, from London to Salford. The reaction of the authorities was revealing. As a Manchester Guardian reported on 11th of May, apropos of the rioting in Liverpool, a great many Austrians and Germans in the city who have hitherto been allowed their liberty are now, it is stated, to be interned in order that they may be preserved for mob violence. A few days later, columns of civilians were being marched out of the city under military escort. Their destination? A concentration camp. Two days after the rioting, the Chief Constable of Manchester ordered the arrest of every German shopkeeper in the city. Similar actions were taken elsewhere. The pretext for the rounding up of harmless butchers and tobacconists was that these men were being taken into protective custody to save them from harm. It was widely known, though, that the arrests were really reprisals for the sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania, the event which had triggered the rioting in the first place. The expression concentration camp really only acquired negative connotations during and after the Second World War. Before that time, concentration camps were known simply as places where civilian prisoners could be held indefinitely without trial, not for what they had done, but for who they were. For example, because they were communists, Jews, Germans, Ukrainians or Republicans. British newspapers in 1914 and 1915 did not hesitate to talk of the concentration camps which were being set up throughout the country. The thumbnail to this video shows a postcard issued in 1916 which bears the words Concentration Camp Frongach. This was a concentration camp in Wales which held Irish political prisoners. Imagine somebody issuing a commemorative postcard of a concentration camp these days. The purpose of these camps was more often than not to concentrate in one place foreigners who might not be fully supportive of the British war effort. These men were almost exclusively German and Austrian, although there were also a leavening of Turks and Bulgarians and Irishmen. Many had lived in Britain for years, sometimes for many decades. There was no suggestion that they really posed any threat to British interests. It was enough that they had been born in an enemy country. The Defence of the Realm regulations provided the legal framework for imprisoning civilians from enemy countries, but it's likely that the government was not, at least at first, especially keen to implement such measures. Some Germans living in this country were young men of military age who might conceivably have been wished to return to their own country at the outbreak of war to enlist in the German army and fight against the British. Most had lived in Britain for years. Often they were married to English women and in some cases had become naturalised British citizens. At the outbreak of war in 1914, an old factory stood derelict in East London. William Ritchie and Sons had run a jute factory in Carpenters Road in Stratford, not far from where the Olympic Stadium now stands. There was a fairly substantial community of Germans in East London at this time, they tended to be shopkeepers and there were so many of them in Stratford that it was sometimes known as Little Germany. The Germans had integrated well into the area and it was not until the war began that any sort of friction had been known in Stratford between the English and Germans. There were, however, other shopkeepers in East London whose antecedents were not so conspicuously British and on the 15th of December 1914, a large number of these men were arrested by the police and marched to the disused jute factory in Carpenters Road. The Stratford Concentration Camp, for such was its official title, had a bad reputation amongst those in turn during the First World War. Surrounded with barbed wire and with mounted machine guns pointing down at the prisoners, it was a grim place to spend the three years it was in existence. 
Writing of it in his autobiography, The London Years, Rudolf Rocker wrote that the Stratford camp and its commandant had a dreadful reputation. News had spread of terrible things happening there. It was not always the fault of the British military administration. The German internal administration was as much to blame, particularly for a great deal of corruption which existed there. The head of the internal administration was a man named Weber, who seemed by all accounts to be a sadist and did his best to make life in the camp impossible. Those who are familiar with accounts of the concentration camps of the Third Reich will find descriptions such as the one above eerily familiar. The capos, prisoners in positions of trust and authority in Nazi camps, were often said to be even more cruel and sadistic than their German masters. So it was at the British concentration camps during the First World War. The commandants would choose prisoners and place them in authority over the others, this power often went to the men's heads. There was certainly casual brutality at the Stratford camp. 140 prisoners there signed a complaint against the commandant. One man to whom he was speaking refused to address the commandant as sir, for which impudence he was struck in the face by the commandant. It is strange that the memory of these concentration camps established not in remote rural areas within the very heart of the British capital should have faded so completely. You would be hard pressed to find a local resident in that part of London who has even the vaguest idea that a concentration camp was once operating only a few streets from where they live. An even more extraordinary example of such convenient amnesia concerns the concentration camp which was set up in a major London landmark. Alexandra Palace is an entertainment venue in North London. Opened in 1873 as a centre for entertainment and education, it lies between the suburbs of Muswell Hill and Wood Green. Alexandra Palace is famous as being the site of the world's first high-definition television broadcasts, which the BBC began in 1936. Ali Pali, as it is affectionately known to the locals, was perfect for broadcasting, being situated on a tall hill with a commanding view across the whole of London. Ask anybody living in and around the area about the history of Alexandra Palace and you'll be sure to pick up snippets of history of this sort. You might be told of the two huge fires which almost destroyed the place, once in 1875 and again in 1980. One thing you will not be told, because it has been entirely lost to memory, is that a century ago, Alexandra Palace was the site of one of the largest concentration camps which this country has ever known, holding over 3,000 prisoners. At the outbreak of war in 1914, Alexandra Palace was commandeered by the military and used as the headquarters for King Edward's horse. The horses were kept at times in the tennis courts. In March 1915, a concentration camp was established at Alexandra Palace for so-called enemy aliens. These were Austrians and Germans who had been living in the United Kingdom when the war began. Many of them had been living in the country for years. Some had arrived as babes in arms and knew no other country. Nevertheless, because they were technically German or Austrian, even if they couldn't speak a single word of German, they were regarded as enemies. The British were accused um, by the Germans of mistreating the prisoners at Alexandria Palace, although there was very little evidence of this, either in the accounts of the prisoners themselves later or those who visited the camps to check on the conditions there. It was certainly no holiday camp. The place was horribly overcrowded. The 3,000 men slept on plank beds in the Great Hall and the windows and doors remained closed for four days at times, and the stench was absolutely abominable. The staff from the American Embassy made several visits to the concentration camp at Alexandria Palace to keep an eye on how things were developing there. Food was something of a sort of anger among some of the men being held there. These same buckets which were used for mopping the floor were used at mealtime for serving up soup, a fact which made some of the prisoners unable to stomach the meal. 
In the later years of the war, horse meat was substituted for beef and the daily calorie intake for each man was estimated to have fallen to 1,489. The average man needs 2,500 calories a day simply to maintain his weight and health. These figures suggest that the prisoners at Alexandra Palace were, at least by 1918, on a starvation diet. The men who were detained at Alexandra Palace might have faced a meagre and unappetising diet, but at some concentration camps they were being killed by rifle fire. The Isle of Man was thought to be the ideal location for keeping large numbers of prisoners because, of course, anybody escaping would still find himself trapped on the island. Thousands of prisoners of war and civilian internees were held in camps on the island. On the 19th of November 1914, there was a serious incident at the Douglas Alien Concentration Camp as a result of which six men died. There had been a number of complaints from the civilians who had been transferred to the concentration camp at Douglas from the mainland. The accommodation was intense and as the winter approached, the prisoners felt that these were wholly inadequate for their needs. The food left something to be desired as well. Dissatisfaction about the food grew stronger as November passed and on 19th of November the prisoners decided to stage a protest in the dining hall. After they'd finished their midday meal the men began to smash crockery and overturn tables <coughs> jeering and booing at the kitchen staff. Guards were called and when they entered the dining hall intending to disperse the protesting prisoners they were met with a hail of food, pieces of broken crockery and so on. If the guards had simply withdrawn and waited for the men to cool down, matters would likely have passed without violence. In the event, they loaded their rifles and began firing into the dining hall. That the guards at the Douglas concentration camp were intent upon carrying out a massacre seems beyond all reasonable doubt. Counting the remaining ammunition after the firing had ended and the dead and wounded removed from the scene revealed that a total of 34 shots had been fired into the packed dining hall. Five men were killed immediately by the volleys of fire that day and another died later of his wounds. Many suffered bullet wounds and given the circumstances it's a miracle that more hadn't died. The inquest, which was held the following month, found that the dead men were victims of justifiable homicide, the protest in the dining hall having by that time been described in British newspapers as a riot. This wasn't the only instance of a prisoner in a concentration camp being shot dead by guards. A few days before the shooting on the Isle of Man there had been another incident a little closer to London. <clears throat> One of the earliest concentration camps set up had been at Camberley in Surrey. There were 8,000 inmates there in the middle of November 1914 when there was a disturbance one night. At about mid midnight, one of the guards at Camberley heard the sound of running feet and then some scuffling. When a light was turned on, the source of the sound, it became apparent that a group of prisoners were making towards one of the gates. After shouting a warning, the guards opened fire, killing one man and wounding another. It's probably fair to say that few people living in London today are aware that concentration camps even existed in the capital at one time. 